Okay. Hello, everyone. So I'll be presenting today my uh, recent work, my joint work with Dr. Harpreet uh, on the joint uplink and downlink coverage analysis of cellular-based RF-powered IoT networks. So um, every time I present this work, usually people, um, the main question that I'm, I get is the applicability or the practicality of using energy harvesting in communication networks. So I'll start by providing some numbers. So um, the main motivation for um, moving towards energy harvesting networks is the, um, of course, the getting, uh, moving towards green and self-sustained wireless networks. And the other thing is um, that there's a lot of off-grid off -grid areas, that, areas that are not covered uh, with sources of energy, like stable sources of energy, in many places over the globe. So, uh, for example, we have a case study here in Ghana, in Africa, where 10 solar powered base stations were deployed to cover the off grid um, locations. And this uh, represents about 60% of the overall uh, land area in 2012. And this was um, successfully working, and it had um, each base station that is solar powered had about at 10 kilometers of coverage area and could serve up to uh, 1,500 subscribers. And um, as I noted from uh, growing, going through different uh, resources online, that most of the efforts are directed towards um, countries in Africa and in Asia. And uh, I mean, in general, uh, developing uh, countries. So we can see here in this snapshot, it was a bigger one, but I focused on where um, the density is larger. So uh, every, um, the numbers inside the circles represent the number of solar powered base stations in, in this country. So as we can note that we have uh, India, China, and Indonesia has the most uh, numbers of uh, solar powered base stations. And there was also outside these snapshots some in uh, Colombia and some in Australia. Uh, the number in the U.S. is very low, like one or two or something. And the motivation for moving towards uh, solar-powered base stations uh, varies from one place to another. Like we can see, for example, uh, in most of the places in Africa, the main reason is that this is the only solution to cover some locations. There is no availability of energy, or other energy resources, so you have to use the um, renewable resources. <clears throat> In other places, it's just the motivation to, to have self-sustainable networks and to move towards saving some energy consumption, knowing that 3% uh, uh, of the energy consumption around the globe is uh, represented by the energy consumed by the base stations, and 2% of the CO2 uh, emissions is caused by the base stations. <clears throat> uh, with that established, we talk about another resources uh, that can be used for energy harvesting other than uh, solar energy like piezoelectric, uh, thermoelectric, and ambient RF signals. And I will focus today on uh, ambient RF signals, which is what I'm using in my research work. And this has been proved to be uh, able to, uh, to charge um, many um, kinds of low power devices. And this includes um, uh, like any kinds of low power sensors for either uh, medical purposes or uh, for building automations like uh, HVAC sensors and security sensors and lighting controls. And I'm presenting here um, an example of um, a chip that is used for RF uh, energy harvesting. This is uh, harvests RF energy and converts it to DC energy. And um, it's like a size of a credit card. And this, this company is called Powercast. It has uh, another, this was in 2012, I guess, or 2011. They have recent products that are, um, that are even more advanced than this one. And <clears throat> the, you can visit their website. It's called powercastco.com. And you will find the data sheets for the recent uh, chips that they are, um, that they are uh, producing. Uh, with that said, we can say that since the main kinds of applications that can be charged using 
RF energy is their low power sensors. So uh, uh, Internet of Things or IoT is a reasonable candidate to be powered using RF charging uh, for many reasons. And this includes the deployment of IoT in uh, hard to reach locations and the large numbers of sensors uh, that will be uh, deployed in uh, sparse locations. So it will be um, uh, impractical to um, power these uh, sensors using batteries and the need to replace these batteries. So we'll have to move towards uh, energy harvesting and one of these solutions is RF energy harvesting. Uh, with that being said, uh, we can um, motivate our exact problem that we are working on in our search. And we will start by talking about the, um, the difference between our work and the existing work. So we are talking about uplink downlink coverage analysis uh, in our work. So the existing work focuses on either only uplink or downlink analysis, but not the joint analysis of both of them. And even those who um, focus on the uplink or downlink, they usually avoid the joint analysis of the signal to noise ratio in the downlink and the amount of harvested energy. Because this is, uh, as we can see, as we will see in the next few slides, that it's uh, really complicated. So people usually focus on separately just uh, analyzing the coverage, uh, the energy coverage probability or um, the expectation of the amount of harvested energy. Um, I can also uh, introduce the, the terminology of energy coverage probability is defined by um, harvesting a minimum amount of energy required to uh, do your uh, processing and your communication. <clears throat> so now we uh, move to our system model. So here, as we can see, we will focus on um, a single IoT device, which is, um, so we have two networks, the IoT network and the cellular network. The cellular network is used to manage the IoT network. So it performs um, the charging, it charges the IoT devices by providing RF signals, and it also sends and receives information from the IoT network. So we focus on an IoT device, a single IoT device placed at the origin, and we assume that uh, each time slot is divided into three sub-slots. Charging sub-slot, downlink sub-slot, and uplink sub-slot. So in the first one, the, um, our, uh, the uh, cellular network or the base stations just act as uh, sources of RF energy, and they're just uh, charging the IoT devices. In the next sub-slot, um, the typical device or the typical IoT device um, associates with its uh, closest base station, and it starts receiving the downlink information. And in the, in the last sub-slot, the typical IoT device transmits information in the uplink. And we assume that the um, IoT device is solely powered by RF energy and that the cellular network is the only source of this RF energy. And of course, the locations of the base stations are um, assumed to be modeled by a homogeneous uh, Poisson point process modeled by uh, 5B. So um, in, another, in another works existing in the literature, people assume the existence of um, a power beacon or a, a network of power beacons. So people assume that the, there exists a network that is dedicated only for charging um, the, the, the typical IoT device or the IoT network. Like, um, independent of the cellular network. So we have a cellular network for communication and we have uh, a power beacon uh, network just for charging. In our case, we will focus on the, fact, on the case that um, the cellular network is the source of energy and also the, um, the, the, the network used for communication. So this introduces some correlation between the energy harvested and the value of the signal to noise ratio in either downlink or uplink, which wouldn't appear in the case of assuming a power beacon network. Okay, uh, yeah. So if we first model the amount of harvested energy, which would be um, the, 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 the duration of the charging subslot, which is tau 1 multiplied by T capital. T capital is the duration of the whole time slot, multiplied by eta, multiplied by the summation over all the base stations 
the transmission power PT, the, the fading gain, which is assumed to be Rayleigh, which is GX, and the, the path loss, which is X per negative alpha. Um, uh, the value of eta, according to um, the company that I referred to earlier, Power Cast Company, according to their products and their data sheets, can be up to uh, 75%. This is called the RFDC conversion efficiency. <clears throat> and also we need to define the signal-to-noise ratio in both uh, the uplink and the downlink. So here we define the case of the uplink and we have, since we are assuming uh, that we are associating with the nearest base station, we have the value of uh, path loss is X1. X1 represents the location of the nearest base station in uh, the numerator and in the numerator, in the denominator we have uh, the, the signals coming from the rest of the base stations. And um, we can note here, I'm here uh, presenting again the expression for the energy harvested so that we can um, note the, 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 the correlation between both expressions. We can see, although we are assuming that the fading gain between the charging subslot and the downlink subslot is independent, which is here is modeled by H and here it's modeled by G. They are independent, but still we have um, the correlation source is the point process itself. We have here the energy harvested is function of the locations of the point process uh, representing the, the CERNR network, which appears mainly in uh, the interference term in the SINR and also the nearest one and the nearest one in the numerator in the SNR model. So this will introduce um, a very large correlation between the two terms. So here you assume that energy harvested comes with a fixed rate? Um, like for each, each time slot, I harvest a, a specific amount of energy depending on the duration of the charging subslot. So it's a fixed rate at least? Yeah, yeah, you can say that. Okay, so um, yeah, here I just wanted to clarify the, the amount of correlation that's happening between the harvested energy and the value of SINR in the downlink. And now we move on to the value of the SINR in the uplink. First, we are assuming a fractional um, power control at channel inversion so that uh, each IoT device in the uplink transmits a value of rho multiplied by um, the distance to the nearest base station or the tagged base station multiplied by epsilon alpha. So this is called the fractional uh, channel inversion power control. And now we present the um, expression for the SINR value in the uplink. And here we can note that there is no uh, explicit source of correlation between the SINR and the harvested energy is except for the location uh, x1. We can see there is no uh, function here that's dependent on the point process of the base stations, the locations of the base stations. Instead, we have here uh, phi a, and phi, phi a represents the locations of the users that are active in, uh, that are selected in a, in a given resource block. So this is like explicitly there is no correlation between them, but there is an implicit correlation uh, between both uh, the point process phi A and the point process representing the base station locations, which is phi B. But it's usually uh, in the energy investing uh, literature, literature, it's usually uh, neglected. So we can say that the main source of correlation between this term and the energy harvested term is the, uh, the location of the nearest base station. And here we, we, uh, we can see the value delta i. This represents uh, an indicator function that is uh, accompanied with each user. And it's equal one if the user has have harvested enough energy to be active and to perform uplink and downlink communication. And it's equal to zero otherwise. With that being said, we present the minimum required energy so that we can say that this user is active and it's equal to uh, this expression. So the first expression represents the minimum amount of energy needed for downlink communication. And this, uh, the second term represents the amount of energy needed to perform uplink communication. 
So we assume that um, for a user to be active, it needs to amount to harvest a minimum amount that enables it to perform uh, both uplink and downlink communication. <clears throat> So uh, moving to the uh, metrics that we are going to derive, we introduced the um, joint uplink downlink communication coverage probability as the probability of harvesting enough energy to perform both uplink and downlink communication and having SNR, uh, SNR values at both uplink and downlink above a, a predefined thresholds. So we can see the um, here, this is the expression for the uh, joint uplink downlink coverage probability. And also we are going to um, uh, study the cases of a downlink coverage probability, assuming that there is no uplink communication required. And the case of uplink coverage probability, assuming there is no downlink communication required. So um, we can uh, intuitively uh, think of uh, the fact that if we derive this expression, Will be, will, it will be very easy to the, um, derive, get this expression or this expression just for, by turning off. For example, if I want to get the downlink coverage probability, I'll just turn off everything related to uplink uh, communication in this expression. Uh, I will, for example, um, uh, put the value of the uplink uh, subslot equal to zero and put this uh, threshold equal to zero. If I just do these substitutions, I will move from this expression to this expression, and the same thing goes for the uplink coverage probability. So uh, as we said before, the main source, uh, the main challenge in this analysis is the high correlation between the harvested energy, the SNR value in the downlink, and a little bit the SNR value in the uplink. So the approach that we take to um, tackle this problem is to uh, do uh, some approximations in the expression of the harvested energy and in the interference term in the SINR. So in the harvested energy, instead of having it as a function of the whole uh, point process representing the base station locations, we will approximate it by the uh, received energy from the nearest two base stations and the expectation of the rest of the RF signals. So here we will have uh, the harvested energy only function of the nearest two locations. Same thing we will do for the interference term in the uh, signal-to-noise ratio in the downlink. Also, it was a function of the whole point process except for the nearest one. We will approximate that by the signal coming from the nearest interferer, which is X2, and the expectation of the rest. By, doing the, by following this approach, uh, keeping in mind that in harvested uh, in the energy harvesting literature, it's a commonly um, assumption, co commonly used assumption, that um, that the only source of RF energy is the nearest base station. I want to say that the nearest base station uh, represents the dominant, the dominant RF energy received by the IoT device. So this approximation is motivated by this uh, fact. Um, taking another look at the three um, random variables that we are trying to get the joint uh, probability of, after doing this approximation, now we can see that the, the expression for the harvested energy is only a function of uh, the fading gains and the locations of the nearest two base stations. The SINR and the downlink is the same thing, only function of the nearest the locations of the nearest two base stations and the fading gains. And as we said before, the uplink uh, will be only correlated with both of them through the nearest, uh, the location of the nearest base station in the numerator. Um, so uh, given that the fading gains in the three subslots is assumed to be independent, we go through this uh, direction by um, conditioning each of the three probabilities on the locations and analyzing each of the three terms separately, getting an expression for each of these three terms separately. And after that, we'll take the expectation over the point process. 
given that we did this approximation that we just talked about, this would be relaxed to the case that you are only conditioning on the locations of the nearest two base stations, or in the case of uplink on the nearest one, and you'll only need to take the expectation over the joint probability of uh, the nearest, the locations of the nearest two base stations. <clears throat> so the only job that we need to do here is to um, derive each of these three probabilities, these three conditional probabilities inside the expectation. And this is a, a kind of a straightforward uh, job. So um, we get an expression for the joint uplink downlink coverage probability, the downlink coverage probability, and the uplink coverage probability. I'll be showing only the case of uh, the downlink because uh, the insights that we got from the three of them is the same. So here we have uh, two expressions. The first expression um, doesn't have anything uh, um, about the energy harvesting performance. The second expression have that. We can see here that the first expression, if we replace the value of A in the upper limit of the integral, if we replace that by infinity, the first term represents the coverage probability in the case of a regularly powered network. So we can say, and also if A approaches infinity, the second term will go to zero. So we can say that this uh, value of A represents a tuning parameter that I can use if I, wanna, if I want my performance to be similar or closer to the performance of a regularly powered network, like a, a network with uh, stable sources of energy, I just need to increase the value of this A. So this A, as we can see here, captures uh, in, uh, inside it its function of C of tau one, which is represented here, captures inside it the effects of um, mostly all the system parameters including the RFDC uh, conversion efficiency, the density of the base stations. So we can intuitively say that as I increase the density of base stations, I will have um, more amount of harvested energy, so I will be closer to the performance of a regularly powered network. So it captures the effect of the density, captures the effect of the duration of the charging sub-slot as well. If I increase the charging, uh, the duration of the charging sub-slot, the value of A will also approach infinity and my performance will approach the performance of a regular power network. Same applies for the value of uh, transmission power of the base stations. Uh, and here we have uh, another functions that appear in the expression, like the joint probability of the distances to the nearest uh, two base stations. <clears throat> another another uh, intuition that we can get from this expression is that this value of A represents a uh, threshold on the value of the distance to the second nearest base station. As long as I have my distance to the second nearest base station, R2, is less than this threshold A, my performance will be similar to the um, regularly powered network. Yeah. So here we start um, comparing our uh, theoretical results with simulations. Uh, here is the, the case of Dowling. We simulate the coverage probability, uh, which is the joint uh, probability of the SINR and the harvested energy. And we can see there is, um, they are fairly tight, and there is some gap that is caused by the approximations that we did. This is against the time switching parameter or the duration of uh, the charging sub-slot. So this trend here that we can see, and it's uh, expected, as we increase the duration of the charging sub-slot, this will not affect the performance of the SINR coverage, but it will increase the, uh, the performance of the energy coverage. As I increase the duration of the charging cell slot, I will receive more energy. So I'll be, um, I'll be with high probability covered in the, the jet, I will be high probability covered in the SNR and in the harvested energy. So this trend motivates us 
to study another performance parameter, which is the throughput. So we define the throughput as shown here, which is um, the product of the duration of the downlink subslot multiplied by uh, log 2, 1 plus uh, the SNR threshold multiplied by the coverage probability. Uh, why is that? So we have the coverage probability is an um, increasing function of uh, the, tau, the value of tau 1, which is the charging duration. Or you can say that is a decreasing function of the value of tau 2. So we can expect, for, just from the expression itself, we can expect the existence of an optimal value of the ch charging duration that will give me the maximum throughput. And this was, um, uh, this was verified using simulations, as you can see here. Uh, in the uplink, we did a similar, uh, we had a similar um, results. Yeah, I think so. So, in previous slide, in this of beta, shouldn't we use the real SINR value? So, this is a threshold, right? Yeah, right. So, we have, like, these are two approaches. Uh, we can, you can do that assuming that in each downlink, you will be able to find the value of the SINR and then use it as, uh, use it in your transmission rate. Or we can assume that the, the, the base station is using a fixed transmission rate, which is log 2, 1 plus beta L, beta DL, and it will be uh, received successfully or not, depending on the value of the SNR at the receiver. This one is somehow allowable for... Yeah, the, uh, you, can, you can see it like that. <clears throat> Any other question? Sure. How many devices uh, are we looking at right here for the average down link throughput? How many devices? How many devices? So we are modeling the location of the devices using a uh, Poisson point process. So since uh, the Poisson point process is a stationary process, we focus our analysis on a typical device located at the origin. So the, the, the number of devices doesn't impact the performance here. So are we looking at the throughput of the network of devices? Yes, on the left, because the performance you know, doesn't change. The performance doesn't change from one device to another. So you're saying that the expected downlink uh, average throughput here is network wide. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it applies for any user because but it's a for some purposes. This uh, number is for a single user. Okay. Uh, so it's not for the whole network. But it would be the same for any user. Yeah. Statistic. Because it's a stationary uh, point process. So what applies for the typical user applies for any other user. So you're saying if I have 100 users, you can multiply it. It's just a simple multiplication. Uh, again, uh, the type of uh, scheduling scheme and all those things that you are using, those things you come up with a number for the entire network. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, this result is for a single user. Okay. Okay. So we did the same thing for the uplink uh, analysis, and we had the same uh, interesting results. We have this uh, also interesting uh, queuing parameter, tilde A, that captured the uh, impact of the, syst the system parameters on the um, closeness of your performance compared to a network that is using uh, regular, regular uh, resources of power or it's, uh, or it's connected to the grid. Same, same uh, in insights we got from these results, like as we increase the density of the base stations or as we increase the duration of the charging subslot or the transmission power or the RFDC conversion efficiency, our performance will be closer to these uh, regularly powered networks. To verify that, so instead of like we did before, we, we provided our results against the duration of the charging subslot. For the uplink case, we'll, we'll study the effect of the density of the base stations. So here we, we first provide the value of the energy coverage probability against the density. And we can see that as you increase the density of uh, 
the cellular, the cellular network or the base stations, the energy coverage probability will, uh, will get higher and it will eventually uh, saturate. Here, for example, it saturates at the value of 10. And this value of 10, if we keep it in mind and look to the next slide, here we are comparing the coverage probability, the uplink coverage probability, to the S sine R coverage probability, and the coverage probability in a regularly powered network. So um, we can see that the three of them uh, meet at the exact same uh, value where the energy coverage probability uh, um, saturated to the value of 1. So when the energy coverage probability is 1, you can expect that your performance will be similar to a regularly powered network. We can also see uh, some weird thing here, um, that the SNR coverage probability in the energy harvesting networks we started decreasing initially with uh, the density of the base stations. And this is because as you increase the density of the base stations, the value um, of the energy coverage increases. So the density of active users will increase, which will uh, increase the value of the interference in the SINR value, which will eventually decrease the SINR coverage probability. <clears throat> and this. Um, on the other hand, in the uplink transmission probability, the red curve, which represents the joint coverage of the SINR and the harvested energy, the impact of the density appears more in the harvested energy uh, coverage. As you increase the energy, uh, as you increase the density, the harvested, uh, the, the, the value of the energy coverage probability will increase and will eventually increase the joint coverage probability until the energy coverage probability is equal to one at the value of uh, then is equal to 10, and in that case, the, perfor the performance is similar to the regularly powered network. And uh, that will be it. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to receive any questions.